So I think without further ado, we can get started with Kara Hamley O'Donnell talking about the um, grand apartment buildings up and down and off of Euclid Heights Boulevard, the things that really sprung up around the original streetcars of Cleveland Heights in the early part of uh, the 20th century. Kara? Thanks, Chuck. Um, we've been really thrilled with the overwhelming response we've had to the, our inaugural lecture at the Superior Schoolhouse. Um, we actually added a second date on the 30th of this month because we got filled this up so quickly, and we've actually filled that date, too. So that speaks well of everyone's interest in history here in Cleveland Heights. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the schoolhouse. Um, this is our first lecture here, and we're hoping to have one every couple of months um, about Cleveland Heights history and architecture. The, um, owned, I want to tell you a little bit about the mission statement of what is, we hope to happen here at the schoolhouse. Um, owned and operated by the city of Cleveland Heights, the Cleveland Heights Historical Center at Superior Schoolhouse is home to an archival collection and museum committed to the presentation and preservation of Cleveland Heights history and architecture through documentation, exhibits, and special events. The Historical Center will stand as an educational resource to deepen our citizens' commitment to preserving a rich cultural legacy for future generations. And that's really our goal, what we want to do here. We're really at the ground floor, and we hope with everyone's help and suggestions and uh, patience that we can uh, really make this a place where people can come to these kind of lectures on a regular basis and see exhibits about our community's history. My presentation is intended as an introduction to and celebration of the Euclid Heights allotment, which is bounded by Cedar, Coventry, and Mayfield Roads, and more specifically, the apartment architecture of that district. As I talked about before, um, in the early 1800s, Cleveland Heights was primarily a farming community, and it sat at the top of a bluff, which was often referred to as the Heights. It was also called Turkey Ridge because of the prevalence of turkeys in the area, and Heathen's Ridge because of the prevalence of gypsies in the area. It was also Worthy S. Streeter's Dairy Farm. If you look on the map, you can see Lakeview, this is in 1881. Lakeview Cemetery is here, here's Mayfield Road, and this is Worthy Streeter's Farm. You can see from the large parcels that there was um, quite a bit of land. Streeter also land, owed, land, oh, owned land over there. Um, you can see some of the names of early Cleveland Heights residents like the Brockways, the Stillmans, the Amblers. And I believe there's something, the Priors and the Spences owned property in the area. Um, Streeter was a resident of Euclid Avenue and a wealthy railroad contractor. Um, one of the things that's of interest is that he had bought this large parcel of land to cut the trees down to use them for building railroad tracks. So it was a pretty open, treeless property um, in the mid-1800s. This agricultural community, which is now Cleveland Heights, stood at the edge of Cleveland's tremendous growth. For example, in 1840, the population of Cleveland was 6,000. In 1880, it had ballooned to 160,000. And by 1910, the population of Cleveland was 560,000. Cleveland's booming industry brought more and more people to the area, and this crowded city also needed parks for escaping the congested urban areas. In the early 1890s, architect Ernest W. Bowditch was busy working with the Cleveland Parks and Boulevards Association to design what would become Rockefeller Park, Gordon Park, and the Shaker Lakes Park. He was well known on the East Coast and designed landscaping for Cornelius Vanderbilt's Breakers, the layout of Tuxedo Park, New York, and other elite residential allotments. Controversy ensued about the hiring of an out-of-towner out to design Cleveland Park System and Bowditch remembered local reporters trying to lure him onto a boat with liquor and disreputable women in his name. It's a quote directly from his memoirs. <laughs> um, legend has it that in 1890 or 91, Patrick Calhoun, a South Carolinian known for his consolidation of railways, came to Cleveland on business with the Southern Railway. Um, this photograph is of Cleveland Heights, and I'm not quite sure where, but it sort of reminds me of what Calhoun would have seen coming to Cleveland Heights. Um, a very wooded kind of mucky area coming from Cedar Hill, and then in the, in the background, sort of this cleared area where Streeter's farm was. Um, when Streeter was here visiting Cleveland Heights, he wished to visit the recently constructed Garfield Monument, immediately adjacent to what would become Euclid Heights, and that's in um, Lakeview Cemetery. 
Um, you can see it sort of right in the middle of the screen. Here's my pointer. This is taken from the top of Musicians Towers. Um, and the, the legend has it that John Hartness Brown, who was a local Cleveland man, um, brought him up to, up to the area of Euclid Heights and to show him the best vantage point of the Garfield Monument and that um, Calhoun was so struck by it, he decided to build a development. My theory is that John Hartness Brown really wanted a development and didn't have the money and Calhoun did because the view of the Garfield Monument's okay and this is from the 12-story Musicians Towers. So from the ground, you can't really see it too well. Uh, so at any rate, um, in 1891, Calhoun purchased two, Streeter's 240-acre farm and additional property in 1892 when a preliminary plan was developed. In 1890, a streetcar line had been established along Mayfield Road, though the walk from Cedar to Mayfield was quite a distance for early residents of Euclid Heights' southern edge to travel. Early land sales were very slow in the development. In 1896, and you can see, in 1896, Calhoun donated land along Cedar Glen, also called Cedar Hill, to the Cleveland Park System though he reserved the right to operate a street railway facilities to Euclid Heights. In 1897, Calhoun brought a trolley line up Cedar Glen to Euclid Heights Boulevard. This is Cedar. It came up here. And it turned back right around Edge Hill. And then in 1904, it was later extended to go all the way up, up Coventry, and then tie into the inner urban tracks that were um, already located along Mayfield Road. Let's see, this is from the Plain Dealer. Um, deed restrictions were placed on, this, on the um, properties. And to, his idea was in the Euclid Heights development to attract wealthy p people from, who were moving up the hill from Euclid Avenue because it was getting so crowded. Um, homes must be, have been constructed for single family occupancy and not exceed three stories. In 1898, the minimum home cost was to be from $5,000 to $20,000. That's about $100,000 to $400,000 by today's standards. And depending on its location within the subdivision, certain areas were for the more elite and other areas were for smaller homes. Um, early residents were wealthy socialites often hired, and they often hired notable Cleveland architects such as Alfred Hoyt Granger, Mead and Hamilton, Charles Schweinfurth, or Abram Gar Garfield to um, build their homes. You can see that he really promoted his area. <coughs> This is a slide of the streetcar coming up um, Cedar to Euclid Heights Boulevard. This is probably quite, quite early on. And then these are some of the homes that were built by, the, some of the first homes built in the subdivision that still exist. Several of them were, were torn down during the 60s. But um, this is uh, actually was Patrick Calhoun's own house. It was his first home, his summer home there. He later built a huge three-story palazzo which has since been torn down. This is the John Hartness Brown House. He was the person who first brought Calhoun here. Um, these last two properties were, are Cleveland Heights landmarks, and the John Hartness Brown is actually listed on the National Register of Historic Places. This is a carriage house that went with one of the early grand mansions. The house has since gone, um, but this is a part of Herrick Muse, which was a combination of four carriage houses, and it's also list, a landmark and listed on the National Register. And lastly, the Alexander House, which is the college club um, that I talked about briefly before, um, the T, and um, uh, that's a local landmark as well. This is the Warner Racka House, another la city landmark and one of the earlier houses in the subdivision. By 1912, a handful of families had moved into the allotment and the community stood between a rural and urban character. The report of the Euclid Heights Committee makes note of a problem of automobile companies using Cornell Hill to test their vehicles, then speeding across the subdivision. <laughs> speeding, I'm not sure what that was at the turn of the century. At the same time, residents had to deal with the horses from the Italian settlement grazing on their properties. In 1901, the Euclid Golf Club was open and only the second golf course in Greater Cleveland. The upper nine were, holes were located on the north side of Cedar, around where the, where the Alcazar Hotel is currently located. And the additional nine holes were leased from John D. Rockefeller, who owned the land south of Cedar, which would be later become the Euclid Golf Allotment. Um, it's been told that John D. Rockefeller wouldn't allow people to um, golf on his nine holes on Sundays, so if people wanted to play 18 on a Sunday, they had to play the, the upper nine twice. 
Um, one of the things that's interesting about the subdivision is that it, it was really one of the first in Cleveland Heights, and he was sort of the guinea pig to see what would work and what wouldn't work. And this is what it looked like in 1914. Um, those little dots are houses, or um, basically they're houses. At this point, only houses were allowed. In 1912 and 13, Calhoun's business dealings were in trouble, and he spent much time in San Francisco after being indicted for bribing city officials, a charge later thrown out. By 1914, which was 22 years after he had started this development, only 12% of the lots were occupied, and nearby subdivisions offered further competition to housing choice. Um, Calhoun had paid all the money to bring the streetcar line up the hill, to bring utilities up the hill, and a lot of the other subdivisions nearby were tapping into that, and they hadn't um, put the capital up in the front. Uh, Calhoun was unable to pay his debts. The land was sold at sheriff auctions in 1914 and 15, and deed restrictions were lifted, paving the way for construction of multifamily dwellings and commercial development. After these purchases, large lots were often resubdivided or joined for larger scale commercial or apartment construction. I'm just going to go real quickly through the slides, just a couple overheads, just to show you how things developed. Just kind of keep this in your memory. This is what things looked like in 1914, about the time that Calhoun went bankrupt. You can see a lot of vacant property. Um, the bankruptcy really made things more accept accessible to people of middle incomes. And by 1920, six years later, you can see how many more buildings were constructed. And then um, after, the, after World War I, things really started to heat up in Cleveland Heights as far as construction. This is 1920. This is 1928. So in about a 14 year period, you can just see that things just really um, went to town. Yeah, and you can, if you kind of look, and I'll talk about this a little later, in the upper right and right on along Mayfield, those large buildings are apartment buildings, and also in the lower left part of the screen, the bigger masses are um, primarily apartment and commercial buildings. You can sort of see how things are um, sort of scattered. The smaller houses you can see um, from newer construction. By mid-1915, builders had planned at least seven, quote unquote, big flats, many on or near Hampshire Road. In 1915, City Council passed an ordinance which established a code regulating tenement houses, and in 1921 enacted the state's first comprehensive zoning ordinance to control the rapid development. The end of World War I spurred a construction boom. 1919 brought over $10 million in, in new construction to Cleveland Heights. And I calculated this this morning. It's $99 million today in one year was constructed in this city. The new Cleveland Heights residents needed places to shop. And in 1916, the Heights Center building was constructed in the Cedar Fairmount area. Also, a high-class residential hotel was a necessity in a high-class residential subdivision. Those who traveled and preferred to avoid upkeep of a house, but like, like the service of hired help, might live in a residential hotel. The 300-room Alcazar Hotel, which is also a city landmark and listed on the National Register of Historic Places, was arranged around a central courtyard. Alcazar means home in a fortress, and its Spanish Moorish style was built for those who knew how to live graciously and well, according to an advertisement. Suites from two to five rooms were available, and rent included maid service, Heat, light, gas, silver, china, table and bed linen, full kitchen equipment, and iceless refrigeration. And interior room decorations were each unique, and this is a quote, with that unquestionable taste that belongs to an artist of finer sensibilities. By the end of the 1920s, the Cedar Fairmount district, Business District was complete. Developing contemporaneously to the Cedar Fairmount Business District was the Coventry Business District. Primarily developed between 1919 and 1922, it was anchored by the Heights Theater, which is now the centrum, the vacant centrum, I should say, and was the first fully developed commercial district in the Euclid Heights District. Sort of segues into the next lecture. You can see the streetcar tracks running right down the middle of the street. This is um, uh, Coventry Road looking north. This is uh, where the Winking Lizard is, and this is where the, um, the um, dry cleaner is. Um, in conclusion, to, as far as the history of the subdivision, the bankruptcy of Patrick Calhoun dramatically changed the vision of what Euclid Heights was to be. Once foreseen as a suburban rebirth of the glory of Euclid Avenue, the subdivision completely changed direction. The construction of grandiose homes for Cleveland's elite was supplanted by a boom of developer-built homes, 
most targeted at the growing middle class of Clevelanders. This development took advantage of the convenience of regular streetcar service by constructing apartment buildings and two-family homes for those who could not afford to purchase a suburban home. This shift of direction resulted in a new face for Euclid Heights, one that today creates the primary character of the, of the subdivision. Apartment buildings were first introduced in the United States in the 1860s and had become commonplace by the 19-teens. Functionality took precedent over ornate detailing in apartment buildings across the country in the 1910s and 20s. The early apartment buildings in the Euclid Heights are from two to four stories and from five to 40 units. Typically, a superintendent suite was located in the basement. You can see the uh, radiator hanging from the ceiling here. And um, buildings could be very long and narrow, as these are here, or they could be U-shaped. And sometimes larger units were even E-shaped to allow the courtyard, which would allow light into all of the units. Inside apartment units might only have four rooms. They might have a living room, kitchen, and a bathroom, and a bedroom, which might also double as a dining, sewing, or workroom. And you can see here, this is a closet here, but this very may well may have been a Murphy bed, which was very commonly used then to be, make the rooms have double duty. You could just fold the bed back up into the wall and use it as a sewing room. Um, and uh, there's also, oftentimes the layouts have very long hallways. There's sort of a long hallway and the rooms are all sort of loaded, sort of the shotgun kind of feeling, often with a living room or a sunroom in the front then the dining room, then the kitchen, then the bathroom, and then the bedrooms at the rear. Um, some of these hallways are really are make bowling alleys look short. I'm just going to roll through some slides here and just kind of point out some of the detailings that were present in these apartment buildings. Um, I've lived in a handful of these apartment buildings in Cleveland Heights, so to me it's nothing new, but I know some people have never been inside these, or some people may have lived in one of these very same units, or may still live in one of these units. Um, some of these detailing I just think is really interesting. They were so... Um, smart about making things very utilitarian and making things fit where they, with the built-ins. This is a kitchen. You can see the overhead cabinets and the lower cabinets um, allowing people storage. Um, this is kind of a neat thing. This is actually a basement. You can see the radiator, the pipes running through. But um, they often had these French doors so that a bedroom could also double um, as a living area um, and you could shut it off for bedroom use. The built-ins, you can see this large um, cabinet. This is in a dining room, but it could have been used for clothes or for china. Um, the the hallways, they were utilitarian, but they were really nice. And they've lasted, you know, some of them close to 100 years. You can see ma marble stair treads very sturdy wrought iron um, railings and tile on the floor. I mean, these are 75 years old and this stuff is in perfect condition. And uh, really nice woodwork. I mean, a lot of these you might think that was inside a single family home. They really made a point of making the amenities that many of us have in single family homes. Fantastic light fixtures, um, built in leaded glass cabinets, china cabinets with storage underneath. Again, this is a different unit, but the similar concept. Um, closets with a built-in mirror, just very convenient, making use of the space. This has got some wonderful wainscoting. Again, the built-in china cabinets. This is a built-in linen closet at the end of a hall. On the left, you'll see a, you can kind of see the edge of a very long hallway. You know, you didn't have to have a dresser to take up extra space when you had these built-ins with drawers and things like that. Uh, fireplaces in most units, though most of them weren't functional. Wonderful glass doorknobs, I mean, light fixtures. Uh, that pedestal sink is, um, I think, a sort of staple. I've lived in a couple apartments that have had that exact same pedestal sink. And this is a basement unit that someone sort of jazzed up. The <laughs> I thought that's a very creative way to, to do that. Um, and again, a basement unit that has a fireplace in it. Uh, the wall sconces. Even these little details, there's a little built-in shelf right there, just, you know, to add a little accent as you walk through that doorway. Again, t marble stair treads. This actually has a wood railing, um, but again, you see that sort of same kind of key pattern that's very typical on the kind of tile landings and entranceways. Outside, um, the, most of the places had um, names. This is the columbine and the detailing, the stone detailing and those wing walls, very common. 
one of the things that I find interesting about these buildings, do you see how the very detailed brick wraps and stops right about here, and you've got this sort of structural brick. For the most part, you can't see this from the street because these buildings are so long and narrow, and they're so close to one another. But details like these larger brackets, stone coining, stone banding, and they really, they really paid attention to details. Again, here you can sort of see where that decorative brick bends, blends into the structural brick. Wonderful leaded glass, front doorway. Um, fire escapes at the back were very common. It was a way for people to kind of get out the back door. At the end of that long hall, there was usually a fire escape door. Little, little courtyard created right next to a garage just to give some sort of exterior space for these people. This is a very typical detail of these apartment buildings. It's really not functional. It's just to add, a, create a little roof for this very common green or orange clay tile held up by brackets. Um, it just, just to add a, a little cap to the, the design. See the same thing here? Porches are really, were very key. I mean, we didn't, have a part, we didn't have air conditioning at that time, and most of these units still don't have air conditioning, so the porch was important. I like this because it, it, the porch gets lighter as you go up. It's this solid porch, and it's a little bit of wrought iron, and by the top it's wrought iron that's sort of capped with this broken pediment. Twins were very common. A builder would buy a plan and basically use it two, three, four, five times next to each other around the corner and get his money, money's worth. You can see these two buildings are twins. They're, they've been changed a little bit. Again, two more twins. <coughs> Very similar, a little bit different. You can see the, the sort of the, the area that looks like a castle in the middle. You can, they're, it's a little different on each of them, so they you know, tried to make them look a, a tiny bit different, but you can get the sense. This has a very solid um, uh, brick and stone balcony. This is a recessed balcony, which isn't as common, but it has a nice look to it. This is a real quaint little four unit. Sunrooms in the front, and just sort of added that little arched entrance at each of the bays to kind of give a little character to it. This is sort of a one of a kind here in Cleveland Heights. This is a, a Tudor. It has sort of a, a Disneyland effect to it. It's really a, a great building right on Euclid Heights Boulevard. Again, a lot, of, a lot of these have actually turned into condos too because they're just so nice. This one has some very classical detailing, these little um, swags, um, little garlands here, a little crest. I mean, they really, they took the detailing on some of the finer homes and worked it into the apartment buildings. Very vert this is a very vertical one. It's very different than many of the others in the city. Very classical with the porches. Um, this is called uh, um, dental work, dentaling. And you can sort of see that up there. Um, very interesting detailing. This is one of those U-shaped buildings that sort of looks like two twins um, plunked side by side. This has a lighter porch, back porch, you know, not as heavy as the others, but again, the porch is a key element. This actually has a parking garage in the back, which um, some of the units did have. So I, I just like the, the sort of, it gives you the sense of the even setbacks, the broad lawns that some of these buildings had. I really like this one. It's very different. It just has a very different feel to it. Um, oftentimes, apartments were above um, commercial space on the first floor and apartments on the second, third, fourth story. Very common and a, a great way to make use of the space. I'll wrap up here with two of our favorite apartment buildings because they're city landmarks. And um, this is the El Canyon, which was built in 1916. And it has a very prairie style craftsman um, um, feel about it. It's actually condominiums now. And um, this is our, we la landmarked this about two weeks ago. So we're very proud of it and the owners are very proud of it. Where it's, is that? This is on um, Overlook Road. It's, in, it's, a, it's one of the ones that's featured on your, in your brochure. And lastly, one of our old-time landmarks, the Braverman Brantley Building, which was built in 1937. Very different from anything else in Cleveland Heights. Very Art Deco feel. You see the brick, uh, the, the sort of cut-off balconies here, and the corner glass that goes right up to the corner. Um, a fantastic building. There's penthouse apartments on the top. This very Art Deco um, piece right here in the middle. Um, the apartment buildings in Euclid Heights were constructed to endure both in style and construction. Today, the brick structures stand as fine example of 1910s and 1920s architecture, and their efficiency, convenient location, and stately appearance continue to attract residents from all walks of life. The charm of these grand apartments has remained a constant since their construction almost a century ago, and their initial construction is owed in large part to their proximity to the streetcar lines. 
And um, that's all I have. And uh, I know many of you are interested to hear about the streetcars. And I think I can turn it over to Blaine unless there's any questions. OK, Blaine. Let me introduce again, just uh, briefly, Blaine Hayes uh, works at RTA, um, is uh, very steeped in their history, um, is an author of more than one book about uh, the history of RTA and their streetcars, and about railroads and so forth. Uh, and so with that, I'll just turn it over to Blaine Hayes. He will have books available to be signed uh, and purchased um, at the end of the presentation, and he wants to give it about 60 minutes. He said he can talk all night until midnight if you want him to, but <laughs> we're trying to cut it off at about 9 o'clock and then give you a chance um, after the presentation to still have some questions for him. Blaine? Thanks, Chuck. I don't know if I'm going to spend the whole evening in front of this microphone, probably not, but I would like to introduce myself by saying that this is, this is for me a return to Cleveland Heights. I lived here for 14 years from 1958 to 1972 on Atherstone Road, if anybody knows where that is, off Noble. I was right where Burr Bridge comes into Atherstone. That's where I lived for, where my parents lived for years and years and years. Anyway, I graduated from Cleveland Heights High School in June of 1965, and it's nice to be back in Cleveland Heights. I've always loved it here. I come to Kane Park a lot. I used to work at Kane Park when Jerry Leonard, anybody here of Jerry Leonard with the Heights Youth Theater? A lot of years. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm here to talk about public transportation in Cleveland, one of my favorite subjects. I just completed my 31st year at the Regional Transit Authority. I started with the old Cleveland Transit System in 1969. And I've worked in a lot of different departments, marketing, facilities, maintenance, and rail, and all over the place. So I've had a lot of fun and a lot of memories, and I've done a lot of research and have books, as Chuck mentioned. So could we start the slides, because we got a long show. I'd like to start out by saying uh, that the story of public transportation or the story of streetcars in particular in the Cleveland area. I've done a lot of these programs for a lot of different people over the years and you never know what to show because when I was invited here, can you do a program on Cleveland Heights? Well, yes I can, but that's 25 slides. You have gotta have more than just that, so. Then people say, well, they didn't always live in Cleveland Heights. They moved to other places in the city. And a lot of people have memories throughout the city. So the, the program will be a program about memories around the city. And for some of you old timers, you may remember this particular corner. This is the corner of Mayfield and Lee in 1922. This is a Cleveland and Eastern traction car, an interurban. And that coming straight at us is a city car. This was just simply what they called a Y. It was a place where they turned the cars around. Okay. How many of you are familiar with Psalm Center Road, the, the Golden Gate Shopping Center? That's it. <laughs> this is the Cleveland and Eastern Traction Company. 1899 at uh, very close to uh, Psalm Center Road. There is, a, there is a track curving off here, so that means that there is a Y, a place to turn the cars. Also, the other unusual thing is that the trolley pole is in reverse position here, so they're obviously doing some kind of work in the wintertime. It's probably a crew of workers out, and there's the overhead wire curving around. Okay, this is um, the Cleveland and Eastern uh, right-of-way roughly at uh, Brainerd Road near Wilson Mills. This is prior to the turn of the last century. 
I made that mistake once too. I said prior, prior to the turn of the century and somebody said, oh, you mean two weeks ago. Okay, this is a northern Ohio interurban. We're covering the interurbans first. The interurbans, by the way, were big streetcars that went between cities, between Cleveland and Akron, Canton, Sandusky, and Ashtabula. And before the automobile became popular, everyone rode the big old streetcars. There were steam trains, steam passenger trains, but they were always more expensive and less frequent. The interurban which was built to run through the, the regular streets of the small cities, were built specifically for the local traffic. And that's what this was. And that was a northern Ohio interurban, uh, just about to climb the ramp at East 93rd Street, coming from Akron. This is the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad over here, and then this is the right-of-way going up to 93rd, right at Miles if anyone knows where that corner is. Okay. This is another interurban, but this is an interurban with a happy story or a happy ending. This interurban is still running. This is the Cleveland Interurban Railroad, better known today as the Shaker Heights Rapid Transit. And this is on the Van Aken or Moreland line at Linfield, and that building is still there. It's a historic building. And the three-car train of the 1200 type cars has just arrived on a test run back in the days of the Van Swearingen brothers who built the line. But if you want to ride that line, you still can do it, and that's the nice part. Okay. Okay, for years and years, the roll signs of many Cleveland streetcars started out by saying a very famous topic Cleveland Heights. There it is right there, Cleveland Heights, Fairmont Boulevard, Canterbury Road. This is a 1938 Cleveland Plain Dealer photograph on, taken on Public Square, that's Higby's right there. And now we're going to, that's okay. Now we're gonna look at early day tracks going through Cleveland Heights. So you can have a little better idea of where you are in relation to what is out there today. Euclid Avenue came to Stearns Road, which is almost forgotten today. It's sort of, it's still there, but it's sort of lost. And they, they made a curve south onto Stearns Road, went to University Circle, which was known as Cedar Loop in those days. Then they curved and went directly east and up the side of Cedar Hill. This is the Cedar Hill right here. This is the curve to go down Cedar and Fairmont and then Euclid Heights Boulevard out straight to Mayfield Road. And that's that Y that you saw in the picture before. You have, you had streetcars in, on three major streets in Cleveland Heights. You had Cedar Cars and how many people know where Hampstead Road is in Cleveland Heights? Hampstead Road was the end of the line. The cars went up Cedar to Hampstead Road and backed into Hampstead Road. If you walk down about 300 feet down Hampstead Road from Cedar, on either side of the street there are two steel poles. And those steel poles are left over from the streetcars. They held the overhead wire, and they're still there. They have street signs or something on them. RTA, by the way, has a rule. If you use one of the old streetcar poles and you hang a sign on it, it's yours. <laughs> so this is the... Uh, notice it wasn't Euclid Heights Boulevard. It was Euclid Boulevard. This is very early. This, pic this drawing... This is a pen and ink drawing that was made roughly about 1907. But you have your familiar streets, Lee, Mayfield, Edge Hill, Overlook, Ambleside. Ambleside, by the way, coming down the side of, the, of Cedar Hill was that little street that's still there that you almost hit the streetcars when you came down. Um, and uh, Cedar, of course. So this is your track layout, and then these lines represent the power distribution system to provide the power for the overhead wires. Okay. This is Stearns Road. 
We just mentioned it. Coming from Euclid Avenue up here like this, Cleveland Heights Mayfield Center Road is the roll sign. The streetcar is now going to turn, go through Cedar Loop, up the side of Cedar Hill, and down Euclid Heights Boulevard. This is, this is kind of dark, but this is the side of Cedar Hill. That's Ambleside right there. This right-of-way is still there. And after the uh, Fairmont, after the last of the Fairmont streetcars were abandoned in 1948, uh, the city urged that this right-of-way be, be kept, be retained. And so it was retained until 1957 with the tracks going up and then down Euclid Heights Boulevard as far as Coventry, and I'll show you a picture of that later. And finally, in 1957, they, took the, they cut the poles, took the track out. But there were double tracks on the side of, of Cedar Hill. Now, if you've ever wondered why that reservation over there is so wide, that's the reason, because they had the double streetcar tracks. And of course, these buildings, these apartments and things are still there. Okay. This is another view of that right-of-way with the double track. And this is the photographer's car. Imagine parking there today. They'd wipe you right out. This is Ross H. Bernard's car. And he was the official CTS corporate photographer for 45 years and took a lot of these pictures. Okay. This is, I'm going to leave this picture on the screen for two hours. The reason, this is the only color picture that I have of the Cleveland Heights lines. <laughs> so you can look at that for two hours. Now the reason, the reason that this was even taken, this was taken in 1948. The motorman, you can see just his gray shirt there and his tie, but his name was John Gatiss. And he was a, he was a rail fan. In other words, a guy that likes streetcars, like me. He worked for CTS, and he apparently, uh, this car marked special, he apparently had permission to run it out on the line and stopped and, and had somebody take this picture. And they were, this was a very early color slide. The oldest color slide I've ever seen is also in this program, 1938. But this is, a, this is a color slide of the side of Cedar Hill. Very, very rare. There's the bridge where the rapid goes over today and the, the, where the buses pull under and stop and then they come out here. Okay. I know, that wasn't two hours. Okay, this is the top of Cedar Hill. Now the tracks going to the left are Euclid Heights Boulevard. The tracks going to the right go up Cedar Strait and then up to Fairmont when they curve to the south. And there's a, there's a grocery store over here that's a lot of controversy about right now. Okay. Okay, now this is looking from the other side of the street. This is the track on Cedar Hill coming up to Euclid Heights Boulevard. And again, the roll sign says Cleveland Heights. I like that. Now, the Alcazar Hotel was just a block or so down from where this picture was taken on Euclid Heights Boulevard. Uh, again, you have Mayfield and Center Road, Warrensville Center Road. Now, Warrensville Center Road at Mayfield turns into Noble Road today, of course, but not in those days. And one of my favorite memories there used to be a drugstore. I have no idea what the current situation is, but there used to be a drugstore there called Gable Pharmacy. And the streets where that's where the streetcars turned around. They they pulled in front of the Gable Pharmacy and backed in to that uh, point at Warrensville Center Road and Mayfield. And that's where this car is going. If you drive into that area today where Gable Pharmacy, I don't know if it's still there or where it was, if you drive straight back between the two buildings into the parking lot behind, there is a big apartment there. And right in front of that apartment is a little area where the, the land is separated. And if you look in the middle of that, there's a steel pole laying in the, in the dirt 
And that steel pole held the wires for the streetcars. It's, it's never been moved all these years. Okay. This is Euclid Heights Boulevard in the great days of the streetcars. Now, this is an inbound car because it says Euclid Public Square. Again, the cars down Cedar Hill, Stearns Road to Euclid Avenue, and then all the way to the square. One of the saddest things that ever happened in this city is when they got rid of these wonderful reservation-type streetcar lines. We had Shaker Rapids all over the place, and we got rid of them. It was really crazy. And the only reason, of course, is because part of their time they were running in the street. And, of course, in the 1940s, after the Second World War, you didn't want streetcars running in the street. Now, of course, no problem. But back then, it was a no-no. All right, next slide. I'm going to tell a story about that in a little while. This is one of my favorite pictures. Coventry Road, of course, is, is, is famous today for its restaurants and the Dobama Theater and some of the other. By the way, I worked at the Dobama Theater, too. That was a nice. Don Bianchi is a real good friend of mine. All right, now, this is Coventry, and this is a newspaper photo. It's the only picture I've ever seen of Coventry with a streetcar on it. And, of course, this is Mayfield Road, and the photographer is standing right where it goes, the corner of Euclid Heights Boulevard. You saw a picture of that in the last program with the, with the Heights Art Theater and the streetcar coming down. All right. Okay, now we're on Mayfield. Part of Mayfield was sort of a, a halfway reserved center strip. It wasn't all the way, but it, was, it had the poles, and it had a small concrete strip down the center, and then the center poles. And that was eliminated early. Then they strung the wire across, and, it, and there's pictures of that later. But this is one of the early 400-class uh, cars, probably n looking at those automobiles. That's probably right around World War I. This is uh, the Rockefeller Building, which up until several years ago, has anybody heard of Strikes Pharmacy? It was in the Rockefeller Building there at Lee Road and uh, uh, Mayfield. And that's where this picture was taken, and that is the Rockefeller Building there, and the word Cleveland Trust right there. So that will give you an idea of where this is. Um, the streetcar is coming out of a Y, just a turnaround Y, and this car is on, is on the line going east. This is uh, 1938. This is that picture I meant. This is uh, Mayfield later on. This is up near Severance Center. Uh, of course, that was way before Severance Center was built. John L. Severance probably still lived there at the time. But anyway, uh, this is what they did with it. They eliminated the center strip, strung the wire across, and, and made it more uh, automobile friendly, I guess you'd have to say. Okay. This is the Gable Pharmacy. Uh, why? That's Gable Pharmacy right there, or was. And this is the streetcar that is just pulled in the back. That's the steel pole that's still laying back there. And the bus, uh, Cleveland and Eastern bus, is waiting, or the Chagrin Falls bus is waiting for passengers to be taken from the uh, transfer from the streetcar to complete your trip. This is that same corner. Uh, probably in the early 1920s. No, this is, uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is Mayfield and Lee. This is looking east. And this, the city, this is the city car, and it's, it's Ying, it's turning in the Y. All right. Okay, now we're going to take a look at a, another little piece of history. The original... Shaker Heights Rapid Transit was known as the Shaker Lakes Line of the Cleveland Railway. And this is a drawing from the same period of time, 1906, a pen and ink drawing showing the Fairmont Boulevard Line, which was the Van Swearingen's earlier. They, were, they inspired the construction of the Fairmont Boulevard Line when they were selling real estate in Cleveland Heights. Then they went to Lakewood and pretended that they were their sisters. 
because they had some problems, so they changed their names. Then, they, I can't tell that story because we don't have time, but then they came back east to Shaker Heights after they talked to Mr. Gratwick, who was with the Connecticut Land Company that owned this area, and they talked him into building Shaker Heights. And the Shaker Heights Rapid Transit resulted because the Van Swearingen's insisted on having, just like they did in Cleveland Heights with the Fairmont Boulevard line to Lee Road. And this is an early, I never saw, in all the, in all the research I've done, I never ever saw, except for this drawing, this thing called the Shaker Lakes line. This is the only place I ever saw it. So it's, it's kind of historically significant. But again, it goes down Fairmont Boulevard to Cedar, to Euclid Heights, and then down the hill. Okay. Uh, Lee Road. Okay, here we go. Cleveland Heights, Cedar, Taylor Road. That, of course, is the Hampstead Y. It didn't actually go all the way to Taylor Road. But Hampstead is only a block or something from Taylor. And uh, this was taken at the Cedar Car House out on very early picture, probably World War, right after World War I, probably about 1919 or 1920. Okay. This was taken right in front of my alma mater, Cleveland Heights High School, except instead of looking at the school, you're looking south, you're looking the other way. That's, I believe, Goodnor is the name of that street. And this is the streetcar islands. We're right in the middle of the street. Imagine that today. <laughs> Those things would be wheat paste. Okay, the reason this picture is in the show is because it, it's in the scrapyard and the car is out of service and all of this kind of stuff, but it still has Cleveland Heights, Fairmont Boulevard, Canterbury Road, so that's kind of neat. It also mentions Puritus Springs Park, which was over on the west side near the airport. Top of Cedar Hill, now we're going to do, we did before we did the Euclid Heights line and the Cedar line, now we're going to do the Fairmont line. So now we're at the top of Cedar Hill again, and, but instead of coming straight, now we're going up Cedar to Fairmont. Okay, now this is the picture I told you about before that I was going to explain. This is the intersection of Cedar and Fairmont. You'll notice that the tracks end right here and they're paved over. This picture was taken in 1954 six years after the abandonment of the streetcars. They kept this right-of-way intact in case they decided to build a rapid transit, which never came, and it's really a shame. Now I want to tell you the story of, of what happened. The Cleveland Transit System approached the city of Shaker Heights about giving them the Fairmont streetcar line. This was in 1949. For a half a million dollars, they could have built a line from Fairmont and Coventry to Shaker and Coventry, less than a mile in length. Then the other suggestion that was made was to build some track from Canterbury Road out to John Carroll University, to, and it would have been the Cleveland Heights Rapid Transit connecting and going down on the Shaker line. Less than a half a million dollars was the price tag for all of that. And Shaker Rapid says, we don't have the money. So CTS scrapped the whole system. It was really, it was really a shame how close we came to saving some of these really wonderful transportation systems. And that's the Alcazar Hotel. Okay, so at least you know where it is. Now, this is that beautiful, and I mean beautiful. You talk about architecture. The beautiful home right at the corner, as you just turn on to Fairmont and you look straight ahead out the car window, that's that house. It's still there. It's just gorgeous. And this is Cedars right here. So it's just off of Cedar going up on Fairmont with one of our 4000 series cars. This is the same line, the Fairmont line, uh, at Coventry. The church is still there. Anybody know what church that is? I knew somebody would know. 
<laughs> I'm the only one who didn't. Okay. Looking out the front window of a Fairmont streetcar, was, which is what you're doing here, was almost like looking out the front window of the Shaker Rapid Transit. It had that same uh, situation where you had the center reservation with the tracks and everything. And I just think it's such a shame that this was lost. Okay. This is uh, Fairmont, this again, Cleveland Heights, Fairmont Boulevard, Canterbury Road. This is on the reservation, going, I believe, eastbound. And this is Canterbury Road, Canterbury Y, the end of the line at, at that time. Now, the reason that was the end of the line is because when the line was built, that's where the houses ended. Actually, it probably went out further than the end of the houses, but, and then, of course, as the city grew, then what they would do is they put on shuttle buses to pick you up here and take you out. And then when they abandoned the streetcars, then they just ran the buses all the way through. All right. And this is the very end. This is on Canterbury, and that's where the track ends, right there, right in the middle of the street. All right, Cleveland was famous for its motor trailer trains. Uh, unique to all the big cities in the country, we had matching motor trailer trains and they were very attractive. The reason for this is explained in one of my books that are gonna be for sale during the break. Um, Cleveland Transit Through the Years explains the story of how our leaders, our early transit leaders got together with a local car builder which was off of 140th and St. Clair, the G.C. Kuhlman Car Company was located right here in Cleveland, and they built thousands and thousands of city cars and interurbans for systems all over the country. And they were able to work with the early officers of the Cleveland Railway to design these beautiful cars for our system. And this is the... Uh, that's the hospice of the Western Reserve right there, the old Fenway Hall Hotel. This, of course, is the Elysium, which was, by the way, owned by the Humphrey Company, the same people who uh, owned and operated Euclid Beach Park. And that's the reason why in the 50s you could buy Humphrey popcorn balls at the Elysium. Bet you didn't know that. <clears throat> okay. The city type 1200 cars, which were what you're looking at here, these are the cars that were used later on the Shaker Heights Rapid and lasted, and some of them are still around today. But the city-type cars were scrapped by 1948. And that is the reason that this picture is so unusual, because this picture was taken in 1947, the year before this car came out of service. It's the only color picture I have ever seen of one of the 1200s with the city car paint job. And it's on uh, the Clifton line. This is one of our 1300 class cars on Superior, just uh, arriving at Public Square. And that, uh, those cars were built by the Cleveland Railway Company at the Harvard shops. Okay. This is one of the 4000 series cars built by the G.C. Coleman Car Company, and these were probably the best-remembered classic streetcars of Cleveland. And you'll notice now we're in color because we left Cleveland Heights. I gotta explain this. They didn't not allow color in Cleveland Heights. That isn't what I'm talking about. But the Cleveland Heights lines were all abandoned by 1948 and people didn't think to take these until after half of the lines were gone. Then everybody said, maybe we better take pictures of these things. So most of these pictures were taken in the early 50s. Then the Pullman PCC car, this one uh, turning from Ontario onto the uh, northeast quadrant of Public Square. Uh, that's the courthouse right there and the old stone church. And this was the famous paint scheme of the Cleveland Transit System, which uh, was designed by Raymond Lowy. Okay. This is one of the trailers in color at Harvard shops, 
East 49th and Harvard, the buildings are still there. Those big, huge buildings at the south corner of 49th and Harvard was the Harvard shops. Okay. This is another type of Cleveland trailer. These were built by Coleman. A little bit later in the show, I'll tell you where you can see one of these, freshly painted at Trolleyville. Okay. Now, this uh, is one of the old type city cars of Cleveland that was made into a work car and then as a result it survived long enough that a color picture was taken of it. It was out of service but it's still there and still able to be photographed. Okay. Now we'll spend just a couple minutes on the work cars. To, in order to maintain the 425 miles of track in the streets of Cleveland, 425 miles. They had lots of work cars. This is a derrick car, which were, they hauled rail and ties out to work locations for maintenance purposes. And this is one of my favorites. I always show this picture. This is 0775. That's the number of the car. And I ask my audiences wherever I do these programs, if anyone knows, supposedly, this crane still exists. It's supposed to be downtown somewhere along the Whiskey Island area. It's supposed to have been sold to somebody down there, and it's supposed to still exist. And I'm, I've been looking for this thing for 40 years. This is a snow sweeper, double truck snow sweeper. This, the Cleveland Railway and the Cleveland Transit both were responsible for maintenance of the center strip, the devil strip as they called it, the area three inches outside of the tracks and in the center of the, of the two tracks. They were responsible for the snow maintenance and that's what those cars were for. They, were, they used to brush the snow off the tracks. This was Jumbo. This was the heaviest car on the Cleveland Railway. The, the whole center section was concrete. It weighed over 56,000 pounds, and it was used as a work car. The, the Cleveland Railway and CTS crews called it Jumbo. This is the sand car. If, if you remember, how many people remember streetcars in Cleveland, for real? Okay, well then you probably remember when you were kids seeing this car go into the loops to fill the sandboxes. They, they use sand, they even use sand today on the buses. They, they have it in, in little boxes on the vehicles to put on the street or put on the brakes to put on the rails to, to uh, create traction for stopping. But this was 0765, the, the uh, Cleveland Railway sand car. And this was a, another car that you probably saw in the, in the early 1950s, the supply car. It went around to all the stations every day with supplies. If you ordered a pad of paper or a box of paper clips, it came out on this car to the station, 0197. This is a nice picture showing, this was a rail fan trip in 1953, and they lined up one of the 4,000s, one of the... St. Louis PCCs and one of the home-built 100 type cars for a nice portrait at Harvard Shops. Now this is the only color picture I have of the Kinsman line. If you know where 159th and Kinsman is, which doesn't exist by the way, it's a, it's a Cleveland Transit System figment. There is no such thing, but this is where our loop is. That little building is still there. And this is where the buses turn around, but this is the only color picture that I have of the Kinsman line. This was one of the lines that lasted into the 1950s. Now we're going to go on Euclid Avenue. Euclid Avenue was home of the articulated cars, the 5000s. On April the 27th, 1952, we said goodbye to the Euclid Avenue line, and we'll get into that later. But this is where they ran the articulated. These are the bend in the middle. The shaker cars of today are bend in the middle. They articulated the, the Breda cars. Well, they, they think that's new. <laughs> 1928, we had the 
two rooms and a bath type cars. And this is one of the cars, notice the sign, Euclid Windermere, um, leaving the quadrant. This was, monum they called it Monument Loop. And of course, that's, the, mon that's the, the quadrant that has the Soldiers and Sailors Monument to make its trip up Euclid Avenue. And my father tells the story of um, riding a Euclid Avenue car. They stopped at every corner. It was the slowest thing in the world. And when they finally had the 28 Express bus, he said, oh, that was so wonderful. You could actually go more than 10 miles an hour. This is, East, this is a very famous, uh, uh, speaking of landmarks, Rosenblum's. And Mill's Restaurant is somewhere here with the little windmill, wherever it is. I can't see it, but anyway. There you go, there you go. All right, then the Soldiers and Sailors Monument and East 6th and Euclid. But that was your articulated car. And again, the roll sign, Euclid Hayden, East 140th Street. And they also, of course, went to Euclid Beach. The W.T. Grant Company on Euclid. If the Euclid Corridor Transportation Project is built, by the way, this is all going to come back. We're going we're gonna to put all this back, these reservations in the middle of the street. Isn't that nice? I think it's wonderful myself. I think it, it, it should have never been taken out to start with. Now, this is the oldest color slide I have ever seen. This, this slide was taken in 1938 and on Euclid Avenue, and it's really good color for all those mi millions of years ago. And the only reason I know that is because this bus here is green. Well, so what? The Cleveland Railway had green vehicles for a while. By 1942, they were all gone. And so that's how I was able to date this picture. But for, for that date, that's really a remarkable uh, color photograph. This is Euclid Avenue near Playhouse Square. This is a typical safety island on Euclid Avenue in the heyday of the streetcar. You had to wait here in the middle and if the Euclid Corridor Transportation Project is built, this is the type of thing we're going to go back to. This reservations to wait in the center for the vehicle to come along. Somebody asked me earlier about Windermere. Uh, this is at the end of the rapid line, red line, Windermere. That's Windermere. The car barn, this is a probably about a 1903 photograph of Windermere car house. Okay, in front of Windermere or next to Windermere car house was a substation. The building was still there until four years ago. They finally tore it down. And this, is the, this was a substation to power the streetcars. It was built in 1913. It was one of our manual substations and then uh, the streetcars lasted until 1952, and then the substation we use, was used to power the rapid transit for another 10 years after that. Okay. Now we're going to look at the East 55th line. East 55th lasted until 1953, and there are a few color pictures, not too many. This is one of them. And this is another one at where, where, the, uh, where 55th Street goes under the Erie Railroad at Track Avenue. This is Track Avenue right here. This was the station for the Erie Railroad, and you could board trains right here. Now, this is a work car. It's not a passenger car. It's a, it's a, it's a Derrick car, but it's the only picture I had of a car in this location, so I had to use it. By the way, uh, at the Northern Ohio Railway Museum, down near Chippewa Lake, we have one of these, and we're hoping to restore it someday. Actually, we have everything in that picture. We have the, we have the Derrick, and we also have the flat car. Okay. Now we'll take a look at the, uh, one of the southern legs of the East 55th line. The 55th line went in two legs. This is the corner of 71st and Lansing, and actually this neighborhood 
hasn't changed too much. The streetcars aren't there anymore, but pretty much everything else is, uh, is the same as it was then. And this is what was known as the Willow Freeway. Anybody heard of the Willow Freeway? Has anybody ever driven Interstate 77 north into Cleveland? That's it. Just as you pass this area today, you can still see this piece of the East 55th line coming down. And the car went to 71st and War Avenue. Notice, too, there's a gauntlet track here, a little double track going into the, the shard loop. Okay. This is West Superior Avenue. We're going to cover the high-level bridge subway in a minute, and this sort of leads up to it. West Superior Avenue was a four-track main, and San Francisco's Market Street thought they were the only ones that had a four-track main. We had one, too. Four tracks going down the middle of West Superior. That's Public Square. And we're going west and down into the subway. Okay. This is another picture of the four-track main on West Superior. This is a streetcar about to submerge into the high-level bridge subway at the four-track main, right in front of the Rockefeller building. This is another picture of the four-track main, and there are very few color pictures of this. By the way, this is the cover on one of the books. They'll be available, Steve will have back there. Now, the Detroit streetcars are gone. You see the rust on the rails? But the Madison and Clark are still running, so the rails are still shiny, see? Little things you pick up. <clears throat> Here's the four-track main looking down into the subway. The high-level bridge subway, or the Detroit Superior subway, is the most revered memory of anybody who remembers the Cleveland streetcars. And the county engineer is once again offering tours, and if you haven't taken the tour, it is well worth your time. They are going to start them again in the spring, so don't, when you read about it, be sure you go down and take the tour. This is the West 9th Street Station, again, <clears throat> with an ASA of 10, you didn't take too many time exposures. You just, you sort of just did what you could do with the sunshine. But that's the streetcar underneath on the second deck of the bridge. Now this picture is pretty spectacular. This is taken by Roy Bruce, who was a West Sider, lived on West 100th Street. This is the last day of streetcars. The flags are on the cars. That means it's January 24th, 1954, and he walked out right in the middle of the bridge, which I'm sure they wouldn't have let you do any other time, but on the last day, I suppose, they just looked the other way. But he walked right out in the middle of the bridge and got this dramatic shot of the car coming across the high-level bridge. This is the Franklin Avenue entrance to the subway, which was two tracks. Then the other subway was on Detroit at 30th, and that was the other two tracks. Coming out of the subway at West 25th and Franklin, this is the subway under the high-level bridge. How many people went on the tour two weeks ago? Yeah, isn't that fun? Okay. This is Public Square. This is one of the as far as quality of color is concerned, one of the finest that has survived. This obviously was on Kodachrome. The uh, Olmsted Hotel is the feature of this picture at 9th and St. Clair. Uh, Superior, I'm sorry. And of course the church is still there. And the safety island. This is street furniture of the, in the streetcar days. This picture was taken by Ross Bernard, the, the official corporate photographer of the Cleveland Transit System. This is one of many. Now we're on Superior with fire trucks. I don't know what's going on here, but it's a neat picture. The old fire trucks and the old PCC car. We also have one of these down at the museum near Chippewa Lake. Now we're at East Boulevard and Superior. 
This is East 125th and Superior. This is where the streetcars turn. This is um, Public Square, of course, um, the May Company building, and Euclid Avenue right here. This is Ontario Street coming through. The streetcar is going to make the turn in front of Higby's to pick up passengers. And now we'll continue out the line. Now, I mentioned before the G.C. Coleman Car Company. In the heyday of the streetcar before the 1920s, when we would send a car over to have it be worked on at Coleman, they actually had a roll sign that said St. Clair Coleman's. And it survived long enough on one of the cars in the scrap line that the rail fans were able to roll it up and take a picture of it. The rail fans, I mentioned several times, these are the rail fans. This is January 10th, 1954, and this was the last fan trip on a streetcar in Cleveland. And these are the lucky gentlemen that were, remember Davy Crockett? See, we're right in the middle of the, <laughs> we're right in the middle of that era. These are the lucky gentlemen that rode that trip all over the system. And what happened here, they're near the Harvard shops, and they ran into a piece of wire that had been de-energized because the line had been discontinued. And the car went too far. And so everybody got out, and they pushed the car back under the live overhead so they could back up and continue. OK. <laughs> I put this in to show you, for memory's sake, this is a typical interior of a Cleveland streetcar. No passengers, but lots of memories. Remember the muster roll signs that used to hang and swirl in front of your face? OK. Euclid Beach Park. This is the only color slide I've ever seen of the loop at Euclid Beach Park. This was obviously right at the end because, again, you've got the mar modern cars, the PCCs, St. Louis PCCs. Okay, now this is, one of the, this is one of the slides that's in here for me personally. I have a question I ask at every show, and I will do the same here. If anyone knows the answer to this, I would appreciate it. This is right out of my memory. My dad used to take me in 1950 and 1951 down um, Euclid Avenue on the streetcar to 55th Street. And we would get off right here under this bridge and go in the restaurant that was under that bridge and have breakfast. Then we would walk across the street. The car is blocking the view, but we would walk across the street into the Pennsylvania Railroad Station, which is this edifice here. And we would go in there, buy our tickets, and go and visit his parents in East Palestine, Ohio. Now, my question. I understand that that restaurant, I've had a lot of people tell me that, it's a, that, that it was a Dorsell's restaurant. Can anybody verify that? Okay, that was a Dorsell's? All right, thank you. Well, that was years later. I'm talking about it originally. The Royal Castle came many years later. Okay, thank you. That, I appreciate that. Anyway, this is all still here. The bridge still goes over Euclid. At this, this is Euclid. This is 55th. This, the bridge still goes over. I believe this building is gone, but the building behind it is still there. And of course, the station was torn down in 1957. Okay. Yeah, the brick wall is still there, yes. All right, now I have, this is one of these things you have to do at these shows because everybody gets this all confused. Remember the story about how the Cleveland streetcars went to Toronto and they're still using them? Okay, now we're going we're gonna to take care of this piece of history right now. Yes, the Cleveland streetcars were sold to Toronto. All 75 of the PCC type cars, which is this, this is one of them on the back of a flat car going to Toronto, 1952. Okay. This is the cars in Toronto at the Hillcrest shops. Before they were painted, they're still in CTS colors. This is the Hillcrest shops, which is still there, still going strong. Nine cars came back in 1978. I worked at the Kingsbury shops of the Shaker Rapid. That's where this was taken. This is the only picture in here that I took. This is the Toronto car 
coming back to run on the Shaker Rapid in 1978. Now, there are no to, uh, Cleveland cars in Toronto today in revenue service. So get that out of your head, that they still run our cars. They don't. They have replaced all of them. There are two of them in work service, two of these in work service. It's a grinder train. No passenger cars. They're gone. They were taken out of service in 1982. So tell all your friends that you know something that they don't know. All right. 27 April, 1952. The last day of streetcars on our major street, Euclid Avenue. It was cause for a, they call it a celebration. I think it was more like a funeral. But at any rate, they celebrated this day. They had over 10,000 people show up. You can see them lined up here on the side. And these pictures were taken by the company photographer, Ross Bernard, of the parade. Now, this is not a horse car, by the way. This is an electric car built in 1892. But for the purposes of the parade, it masqueraded as a horse car. And they had the brakes set on the car, the entire parade, and the horses were dragging the thing down with the wheels not turning around the whole time. So the horses really had to work. By the way, that gentleman right there who is acting as operator, or, well, I guess you can't call him a motorman because there's no motor, that's Howard Cumler. Howard Cumler was a rail fan, and he worked for CTS for years, and he was one of the cheerleaders, as it were, for the, for the rail service. Okay, this is what they did was they took all, one of each of all of the old cars out of storage or off, off the scrap line. They got them just so they'd run, and they ran one last time on Euclid Avenue. These are all work cars, but they were masquerading as passenger cars. This is the 200 class. This is right at Playhouse Square. Of course, you can tell that with the theaters and everything, but look at the people. April 27th, 1952. This is the Lakewood water car. Now the reason it was Lakewood is because the franchise in the city of Lakewood called for the streets to be watered down so they had to have this car for that franchise and that's why it lasted in that paint all the way till the end. This is one of the 300 class cars. This is one of the Derrick cars. We have one of these at the museum. This is one of the old 1000 series. So you knew these, if you remember streetcars, these were on St. Clair for years. And one of the 4000s, of course. And the next picture is the only time a PCC car ever operated on Euclid Avenue. This was the only operation of the PCC. Look at the people even in the windows, see there? And the articulated, which were the mainstay of Euclid Avenue. Okay, now, a little bit more history. We try, I try to cram as much history as I can into these things. This is the little uh, horse car, which is really not a horse car. Now the parade is over on Euclid Avenue. The horses are off to pasture. The trolley pole is up, and it's on its way back to the Harvard shops. But the fortunate part is this is one of the few survivors. This car was not scrapped. The Henry Ford Museum at Dearborn, Michigan approached the Cleveland Transit System about this car, that, which had been used as a welding car for many years. Okay, you can go to the next picture. And this is the way the car looks today at the museum at Dearborn. Cleveland Lorraine Car 165, 1899, Brill built car. And you can still see this at Dearborn, Michigan. This is the last day on East 55th Street, March 7th, 1953. And you see everybody is saying goodbye to the streetcar. The last day, January 24th, 10,000 people showed up to ride and take their children on a last ride on the streetcar. I'm sure there's people in this room that were among those riders. Here they are boarding. 
The, the cars can be noted by the flags on the side. That was January 24th. They had 10 cars with the bunting, and they had so many people come, they had to put eight more cars into service to accommodate the crowds. Okay. Toward the end of service, this is what the cars started to look like. They were not maintained, and this is at Denison Station. They just pushed them onto the side tracks and ended up with rows and rows of these damaged cars. And then at Harvard Yards, this is, this is what happened to them. They were scrapped. Very few Cleveland cars escaped this scrapping. This is what they did. They would push them over on their sides, pour gasoline on them, and set fire to them to burn out everything that wasn't metal. And then the metal was cut up and recycled into 1957 Chevrolets. One car escaped. Norman Mueller, a resident of South Lorraine, Ohio. Somehow, he must have had a friend on the inside of the Harvard shops, somehow managed to get this car out. This is car 4144. It was moved to South Lorraine, Ohio, and it was painted dark green, and it had an organ in it. He held church services in it. Now the sad part is that car lasted until 1962 and he had to leave Cleveland and offered it to anyone who wanted it. There were no takers and it was scrapped. So we lost our last car. Now I don't know why this came out so dark, but this is an important picture for this program. This is Euclid Heights Boulevard at uh, South Overlook Road. I can even read the sign. In 1957, the tracks are still there, the wires are still up. This is that period of time they were saving this for possible reuse. This is very important because today we're going back to the streetcar. And I'm just trying to tell you folks that there were people here in this city that cared and tried to preserve some of this stuff, but to no avail. This is a Tom L. Johnson 900 class car. This is a drawing that was made by the General Electric Company for an ad that they ran several years ago. This is a similar car to that, which survived. It's the only Tom L. Johnson car and one of the few Cleveland street cars to survive uh, scrapping. And this was used as a cottage for about 40 years. And this is in where, Steve? What's the? Nelson. Nelson. Why can't I remember that? This is in Nelson, British Columbia. But this is a Tom L. Johnson. He was the mayor of Cleveland until 1911. This is the Tom L. Johnson streetcar. So there are a couple of survivors. Now I told you about a, a trailer that you could ride. This is at Trolleyville, USA, 7100 Columbia Road. This is a paid political advertisement, by the way. Next spring when they open again, you can ride this motor trailer train, which has been preserved. This was on... These, both these cars were from the Shaker line, and they lasted long enough that the rail fans were able to get a hold of them, and they are now running like this, thanks to Steve, by the way. Steve's done most of the work on this, out at Trolleyville. So you can still ride uh, an old Cleveland car set and still experience what it must have been like uh, in the early days of the century. Okay. Now I'm going to just a few shaker slides, not too many. I just want to give you the different car types. This was one of the Canton Maslin smoker cars of the shaker line. Cincinnati Curvesider at Shaker Square. These cars were sold next to the Milwaukee Speed Rail. And this is the car on the nickel plate flat car going to Milwaukee, 1949. They ran in Milwaukee. This is the streets of Milwaukee. And then next, this is the right-of-way of the Milwaukee Electric Railroad Company that the speed rail used to get out of town. And that, after a serious accident, that line was, was shut down. Okay, the 300-type cars. These were smoker cars from the South Elgin line. Notice the apartments on Shaker Square, how new they are. They've only been there a year or so. And one of the 1200s, which is the type car you saw at Trolleyville just a minute ago. 
at Shaker Square. This is another one of the 1200s at Van Aken and Warrensville. And of course, everybody remembers the yellow PCC cars that ran on Shaker for years and years and years. Okay, and this, the other rapid I'm just going to briefly cover is the CTS rapid that goes between the airport and Windermere. And this is at East 55th, the New York Central, and the Nickel Plate Yards. That's the East 55th bridge, the old one, and the blue rapid cars of the CTS. Okay. And this is another shot of them along, steam engines were still running. See the smoke on the bridge? Okay. Uh, this is uh, the Northern Ohio Railway Museum. I've mentioned several times tonight a couple of our cars. We, this is a Northern Ohio interurban, a steel interurban car. We have this, and that's what it looks like. It's, it's reasonably restorable. Okay. And then we have a, none of the Cleveland Peter Witts were saved, but we got one from Toronto. And this is a Toronto Peter Witt car, so we, we will be able to represent this type of car at the museum. And then, of course, the Shaker 1200 at the museum. Now, that's the inside of our new car barn. It now has track in it, nine car car barn, and that's our part of our land, and we're trying to restore these cars. Moving along with our history, I received a phone call when I was in the marketing department at RTA from a lady who was pretty hot, and she said, when did the trolley stop running? And I said, um, January 24th, 1954. No, I saw trolleys running after that. That's wrong. So I thought, hey, what is she talking about? And after a while, I hung up the phone. Unfortunately, I didn't get her number or anything. And uh, after a while, I started to think about that. I thought, you know, she's right. Trolleys ran in Cleveland until 1963. They weren't on rails, but they were trolleys. They were trackless trolleys. So that's going to be the subject of this part of our program. This is Euclid Avenue at East 9th Street, the Cleveland Trust Bank, which is still there, in the heyday of the trolley and the bus, the General Motors buses and the old G.C. Coleman streetcar. This is during the days when they through-rooted Rocky River Drive. That's why the thing says Lorraine Avenue, Rocky River Drive, Puritus Loop, because the Mayfield line went all the way from Mayfield and Noble, or Warrensville, all the way to Puritus and Rocky River Drive. That was quite a, quite a, a route. Now we're going to take a look uh, at the electric bus in Cleveland, so the lady and not me was right. This is a Brill-built trackless trolley at Cedar Loop University Circle. This is that big thing that is all paved today and they have the, the buses go in and the rapid runs up on the top. Where's my pointer? Okay, this is a St. Louis trackless trolley. How many people remember the trackless trolleys? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, if the Euclid Corridor project goes through, as we hope it will, this is going to return to Cleveland, the trackless trolley era. Okay. This is one of the Pullman trackless trolleys, and of course the Lincoln Storage building is still there, and this is where the rapid goes over. And this is that double track right of way that goes up the side of Cedar Hill that we talked about before. And this is our bend in the middle trackless trolley, the Queen Mary. Every transit system has a Queen Mary, and this was ours. Now, this was an articulated trackless trolley, to be sure, but it did not bend back and forth. It only bent up and down, and that was for the purpose of running on uneven roads. And during the time that the rapid transit was, this is the same vehicle uh, after it was taken out of service. During the time the rapid transit was, uh, they were building it and looking for paint jobs, they tried different colors of paint on this trackless trolley that was sitting at Harvard. And that's why it appears here in all these wild different colors. Okay, now we're going to go on the Cedar Line. Higby's, you know where you are. This is High Street, East 4th and High. 
The, the trackless trolleys never, well, not all of them, but some of them never went to public square. The, the eight was one of those. Um, the St. Clair, uh, or the, rather the Kinsman trackless trolleys went to public square, but the, the Cedar trackless trolley never did. This is East 4th and High, that's where they ended. So if you wanted to transfer, you had to walk from here over to the square to get your transfer bus. This is the corner of 9th and Prospect trackless trolley. This is about, this is St. Louis trackless trolley, probably about 1959 or 60. And this is one of my memories. Remember those halushka noodle, Mrs. Weiss's halushka noodle signs on the back? Remember those? <laughs> And that's the Osborne building in the back. These are the Marmon Harringtons in an earlier paint scheme, uh, the, early, the, the same paint scheme that the streetcars had in the yellow on cedar. This shows in the uh, Superior Station or the car yard how they would pull the rope out to rewire the, the trolley to the, to the overhead. This is uh, Cedar Loop again. This is showing the change in era when we left the era of the electric trackless and went into the era of the diesel bus. This is the number eight Cedar trackless trolley sitting in the loop at University Circle. This is where John D. Rockefeller and his wife, the New York Central Railroad is right here and John D. Rockefeller and his wife used to alight at a station, which was right where this sign is, at the East 105th Street Station, when in the uh, middle of the last century when they were making their trips from Cleveland to New York on business. And this is where they would get off, and then they would have a carriage awaiting to take them to their home. Uh, this is called DuPont Loop, which is the extreme northern end of the East 105th uh, transit line. And to give you an idea where this is, right here is Brattonall. So right across the, on the, there's an underpass, and on the other side is Brattonall. Okay, this is another picture showing the various paint jobs of the, of the trackless trolley. Now the, if you think the streetcar was under photographed, the trackless trolleys were really under photographed. Luckily, uh, one of my friends, Bill Vigris, uh, took these pictures right toward the end, and so we have a few nice shots of them. But this is the Robin's Egg Blue paint job that was adopted by CTS in the early 1950s, and it replaced the, the streetcar appearance of the earlier paint job, the yellow the, and tan. Okay. This is a, an era picture. This shows the end of one era. This is June 15, 1963, the last day of trackless trolleys in Cleveland, showing the old coach, which is going to a museum, and the two new diesel buses that are there to replace it. Little did we know how long that era was going to end, or how long it was going to last. Okay, now a bit of interesting history. This is taken at <clears throat> roughly East 6th, right downtown where the trackless trolleys uh, turned around on a loop uh, next to the library. Uh, that's the Federal Reserve Bank to give you an idea where this is in the library. I think this is the building they tore down. Now oh, this is the one that's still there? Okay. The one next to it. All right. This is where the Eastman Gardens is then. Okay. Anyway, the Marmon Harrington, this is the last day and there's a little bit of irony here. Notice the roll sign. The rail fans were fooling around. They had a six Windermere roll sign in this trackless trolley. Little did they know that 50 years later we would be considering actually putting trackless trolleys on Euclid Avenue with the Euclid Corridor project. And if anyone's interested in information about that project, right over here on this windowsill are a couple of handouts that you can pick up after the show. Okay, now we said goodbye to the trackless trolleys. I think this is a spectacular picture. This is a Bill Vigris picture. The sun is almost down on the last day 
The fan trip has just ended and, the, and the, the vehicle is returning to the barn and they stopped and he got this wonderful picture showing the dusk of the trackless trolley in Cleveland. Okay. Now this, if we put them back on Euclid, this is what they will look like. This is the Euclid corridor. Uh, this is a, uh, a sample of what the new vehicles will look like. Notice the overhead wires and notice the double poles. Okay. And that's it. Thank you very much.